Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The Remarkable Women of Elizabeth I's Court Now, a lady-in-waiting was not a role taken lightly, and if you so happened to be a part of Queen Elizabeth I's household, then you had high standards to uphold. By the year 1559, Elizabeth had her household arranged down to a T. She knew what she wanted, and that involved replacing the Catholic ladies that served her half-sister, and replacing them with her cousins and the daughters and wives of the men who served her. These women went on to be referred to as the old flock of Hatfield. Now Elizabeth chose her ladies carefully. Her cousins were the ladies Carey, Nollies and Ashley, and the wives and daughters were the ladies Cecil, Thockmorton, Warner, Sheck and Benger. But these were not the only women by Elizabeth's side. There were also those who had served Elizabeth her whole life, including Cat Ashley and Blanche Parry, to name two. Blanche had been reported to have served Elizabeth from the time she was in the cradle until she died in 1590. Cat Ashley was one of Elizabeth's closest and dearest, and she was immediately appointed the position of Chief Gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber. This role involved almost 24-hour access to the Queen, and was deemed the most prestigious. Cat would sleep on a wooden pallet bed in Elizabeth's bedchamber, and was also given the role of overseeing all the other ladies in service. Blanche Parry, the other lady that had been by Elizabeth's side always, was appointed second gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber, and due to her love of literature, the keeper of the Queen's books. Another woman in Elizabeth's service was Lady Elizabeth Fiennes de Clinton, and she was appointed the role of gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber. And then there was Elizabeth St Lowe, or Bess of Hardwick. Hardwick, who, at the age of 30, was one of the oldest members of the Queen's household. And on the opposite end of the scale, was a lady named Anne Russell. She was the youngest to serve in Elizabeth's household as she was only 10 years old when being appointed the role of Maid of Honour. Elizabeth had her favourites, with those who had served her the longest, but she was also fond of those who had served her stepmother, Catherine Parr, bringing them into the household also. Interestingly, you may think that as women made up the Queen's household, that women were allowed at court but you would be wrong. No woman was allowed, unless under the employ of the Queen. Male courtiers were discouraged from bringing their wives into court, as they would have potentially ruined the image that Elizabeth so desperately wanted to hold on to, that of being the most attractive and desired woman at court. Even the wife of her favourite, Robert Dudley, was not permitted to attend. It wasn't only because Elizabeth was jealous of the relationship between Robert and Amy, but because she felt that way about all the ladies, except for those who were her servants. Elizabeth even went as far as decreasing the number of women in her household. The usual and traditional number was 20, but Elizabeth desired only 11. The chosen 11 consisted of six maids of honour, the lowest number of female attendants in nearly 40 years. Within those 11, there were various positions and each position had a different responsibility. Ladies of the Privy Chamber would attend to the Queen's most personal tasks, such as washing, dressing and serving the table. There would also be the role of the Queen's Chamberers, a role which would be responsible for the much more menial tasks, such as arranging bedding and cleaning the Queen's bedchamber. A Maid of Honour was a role that could only be attended by unmarried ladies. They would join the Queen in public as to attend to her, as well as carrying her long train. The responsibilities of the Maid of Honour also included reading and singing to the Queen as well as dancing. These young girls would be supervised by the mother of the maids. Now normally, a lady-in-waiting would obtain her position through their experiences or their husband's experience at court, and when they joined the Queen's office, they would need to swear the ceremonial oath that was used to form a bond of allegiance between the ladies and their Queen. Now, something that Elizabeth was extremely concerned about was personal cleanliness. Although the standards have significantly improved throughout the years, in the Elizabethan era, a bath every now and then was considered clean. Elizabeth would take baths in a tub that was especially made for her, 
and it would be transported from place to place. If said bath wasn't available, then Elizabeth would have her ladies clean her with wet cloths that had been soaked in pewter bowls. Elizabeth would also clean her teeth, but instead of today's toothpaste, she would make her own concoction of honey, boiled white wine and vinegar, and the mix would then be rubbed into her teeth with fine cloths. Now the duty of preparing the Queen each day would take hours, from bathing to dressing her and hair all had to be just right. Now interestingly, Elizabeth was just like her father in one sense, she did not handle illness well. Throughout her time, Elizabeth suffered from headaches, breathlessness, stomach ache and insomnia. She was also known to argue with her ladies and the doctors, she perceived illness as a weakness. So when Elizabeth found herself with smallpox in 1562, she must have found this incredibly hard to deal with. You see, a German physician by the name of Dr. Burcott was summoned to examine the Queen. His diagnosis was smallpox, even though she had no telltale spots on her face at the time. Elizabeth called him a fool and dismissed him. The smallpox affected the Queen in a way that she hated to admit. By the 16th of October, she was gravely unwell, she was unable to talk, and she would pass out for periods of up to 24 hours, and the doctors feared for her life. The Queen's cousin, Henry Carey, persuaded the humiliated Dr Burcott to return, some reported by Dagger, to the Queen's side. The doctor then ordered that Elizabeth be wrapped in red flannel, laid on a pallet bed by the fire, and given a potion that he had created. Just two hours later, Elizabeth was alert and speaking, and Dr Burcott was no more a fool. By her side through it all was Robert Dudley's sister, Mary Sidney. Now Mary's case was much worse than the Queen's, and she was badly disfigured by her illness. Her husband, Sir Henry Sidney, said, When I went to New Haven, I left her a full, fair lady in mine eye, at least the fairest, and when I returned, I found her as foul a lady as the smallpox could make her, which she did take by continual attendance of Her Majesty's most precious person, the scars of which ever since hath done and doth remain in her face, so as she liveth solitary like a night raven in the house more to my charge than if we had boarded together as we did before that evil accident happened. Now Mary Sidney is listed as one of the Queen's gentlewomen of the Privy Chamber, and makes one wonder if she was the one who attended to the Queen because of her closeness to Robert. Surely, in the big picture, this did not benefit Mary at all. She and her husband served the Queen for many, many years, and felt this deserved more rewards than they received. Now when the Queen was in good health, she enjoyed dancing and considered this to be a favourite pastime. She loved learning complicated routines and then showing them off and her talent and the perfection of it all, something which she and her ladies would spend hours rehearsing together. Of an evening, Elizabeth would retire to her apartments where she and her ladies would spend time unpinning her hair and having every need attended to. She would be undressed and her makeup removed and the state of the Queen, undone, was something only her ladies would be permitted to see. This is part of the reason why, years later, that when the son of Lettuce Nollies burst into the Queen's bedchambers, that it was such a big deal. Now, although to be a lady of the Queen was a sought-after role, it was not lucrative, for this role was mostly for the prestige and favour by the Queen. The pay you would receive was not extravagant, and maids of honour and ladies of the presence chamber were seldom paid at all, whilst ladies of the privy chamber and bedchamber received an annual salary of roughly £33, the equivalent of around £7,000 today. The ladies, as well as not receiving a fair pay, would often only have their meals consisting of the leftovers from what the Queen had, and instead the ladies would regularly receive clothing, gifts and jewellery from the Queen. Their living quarters were also very uncomfortable and cramped, the ladies were subjected to poor sanitation with no bathrooms or flushable toilets, something that Queen Elizabeth had access to, 
The court, as a result, was foul-smelling, and the queen and her court would regularly travel so that the whole place could be cleaned, and all human waste was removed ready for them to return. Now, Elizabeth, however, may have given her ladies lavish gifts, but she was known to fly into a rage when her ladies didn't complete a task to standard. She's said to have hit or slapped them for punishment, and one foreign visitor observed her doing so. She is a haughty woman, falling easily into rebuke. She thinks highly of herself and has little regard for her servants and counsel, being of opinion that she is far wiser than they. She mocks them and often cries out upon them. It is said that Elizabeth had the temper of her father and the charm and charisma of her mother. There was also a lot of downsides for being one of the Queen's ladies, because she essentially controlled your fate. Elizabeth is said to have hated it when her ladies married. One lady to learn that crossing the Queen was bad was a lady called Elizabeth Throckmorton. It was the year 1584 when Elizabeth, or Bess, was only 19 years of age and she came to court and became a lady-in-waiting to the Queen. Eventually, she became a gentlewoman of the Privy Chamber. She was responsible for dressing the Queen, a very intimate job. Bess and her younger brother Arthur both had jobs within the Queen's court, and Bess had been described as intelligent, forthright, passionate and courageous. Bess had been in service of the Queen for six years when she met Walter Rayleigh, a man who became one of the Queen's new favourites, and as one of the Queen's ladies, Bess required permission to be courted. The Queen must also give her permission, or approval, to any man who wishes to court one of her ladies. This is due to them supposedly being seen as extremely virtuous women. The relationship between Bess and Walter became something of a secret one, as they clearly believed they would not receive permission from Elizabeth. It was by the July of 1591 that Bess was pregnant. She had secretly married Walter, but she also understood the risks of marrying without the Queen's permission. You see, if Bess had not married, then her son would have been a bastard, so she found herself with very little choice. Bess must have been aware of the dangers in having the Queen discover she was pregnant and married, that she somehow managed to obtain permission to leave court to stay at her brother Arthur's home in London. It is there that she gave birth to a son in the March of 1592. When Bess returned to court, Elizabeth found out about everything that had happened behind her back, and she was furious. Bess and Walter were thrown into the Tower of London, but when their son was six months old, he died of the plague. It was at this point that Elizabeth released Bess and Walter, with Walter being ordered not to return to court for one year, and Bess, well, Elizabeth never forgave her. The fate of Bess mirrors that of Elizabeth's cousin, Lettuce Nollies. Both women fell in love with the Queen's favourites, Bess with Walter Rayleigh and Lettuce with Robert Dudley. They both married in secret and fell from favour, and both women managed to do something that the Queen never could. They found love. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.